Hi, everybody. I'm so glad that you could come to Literature Out Loud today. We have some wonderful readers. I cannot even tell you how good they are. And we've got one of the best writers I have ever read anything from. His name is Rick Bass. And uh, he um, started out being the son of a petroleum engineer and followed that, followed that line of work, but became a complete advocate for the wild and for environmentalism and moved to a really remote valley in Montana at one point and still lives in Montana and writes from there. And his work is so filled with love for the land and love in general and complex thinking and a lot of inward thought. I've, I really value the way he writes, and I wanted two of the best readers I've ever heard to uh, validate his work for you. So we've got Mo LeMay, who's head of the theater department at Mesa State, and Jean Schumann, who is a good friend of mine and a co-worker and also one of the best actors in Denver. I got to say, this virtual thing has its benefits because we've got these two wonderful readers and we've got the best tech crew in the form of Sean Jeffrey at Thunder River Theater. And we have Wendy Johnson upstairs at my house who just made my computer work within the last few months. So we've got all this stuff going for us. And uh, it just so happens that Mola May has written a whole lot of wonderful things, but he wrote two specific stories, one dealing almost exclusively with fire and one dealing almost exclusively with ice. And how wonderful is that? So I hope that you enjoy these readings as much as I enjoyed picking them and I enjoy hearing them because I know what's coming. So Mo, would you please Fires by Rick Bass. Some years the heat comes in April. There's always wind in April, but with the luck there is warmth too. When the wind is from the south, the fields turn dry and everyone in the valley moves their seedlings outdoors. Root crops are what do best up here. The soil is rich from all the many fires and potatoes from this valley taste like candy. Carrots pull free of the dark earth and taste like crisp sun. Strawberries do well here if they're kept watered. The snow has left the valley by April, has moved up into the surrounding woods, and then by July, the snow is above the woods, retreating to the cooler, shadier places in the mountains. But small oval patches of it remain behind. As the snow moves up into the mountains, snowshoe hairs, gaunt but still white, descend on gardens' fresh berry plants. You can see the rabbits, white as Persian cats from a mile away, coming after your plants, hopping through the sun-filled woods and over rotting logs, following centuries-old game trails of black earth. The rabbits come straight from my outside garden like relentless zombies, and I sit on the back porch and sight in on them but they are too beautiful to kill in great numbers. I shoot only one every month or so, just to warn them. I clean the one I shoot and fry it in a skillet with onions and half a piece of bacon. At night when I'm restless, I go from my bed to the window and look out. In spring, I see the rabbits standing at attention around the greenhouse, aching to get inside. Several of them will dig at the earth, trying to tunnel in while others sit there waiting. Once the snow is gone, the rabbits begin to lose their white fur, or rather, they do not lose it, but it begins to turn the mottled brown of decaying leaves. Finally, the hairs are completely brown and safe again, indistinguishable from the world around them. I haven't lived with a woman for a long time. Whenever one does move in with me, it feels as if I've tricked her, caught her in a trap, as if the gate has been closed behind her, and she doesn't yet realize it. It's very remote up here. One April, a runner came to the valley to train at altitude. She was the sister of my friend Tom. Her name was Glenda, 
and she was from Washington State. Glinda had run races in Italy, France, and Switzerland. She told everyone, including the rough loggers and their wives, that this was the most beautiful place she had ever seen, and we believed her. Very few of us had ever been anywhere else to be able to question her. We often sat at the picnic tables in front of the saloon, 10 or 12 of us at a time, half of the town, and watched the river. Ducks and geese heading north stopped in our valley to breed, build nests, and raise their young. Ravens with their wings and backs shining greasy in the sun were always flying across the valley from one side of the mountains to the other. Anyone who needed to make a little money could always do so in April by planting seedlings for the Forest Service. And it was an easier time because of that fact, a time of no bad tempers, of worries put aside for a while. I did not need much money in April or any other month, and I sat at the picnic table with Glinda and Tom and Nancy, Tom's wife, and drank beer. Glinda had yellow hair that was cut short and light blue eyes, a pale face, a big grin, not unlike Tom's, that belied her seriousness, though... Now that she is gone, I remember her always being able to grin because of her seriousness. Like the rest of us, Glenda had no worries, not in April and certainly not later on in the summer. She only had to run. She was separated from her boyfriend who lived in California and she didn't seem to miss him, didn't ever seem to think about him. Before planting the seedlings, the Forest Service burned the slopes they had cut the previous summer and fall. In the afternoons, there would be a sweet smelling haze that started about halfway up the valley walls, then rose into the mountains and spilled over them, moving north into Canada, riding on the south winds. The fire's haze never settled in our valley, but hung just above us, turning the sunlight a smoky blue and making things when seen across the valley, a barn and another pasture or a fence line, seem much farther away than they really were. It made things seem softer, too. Glinda had a long scar on the inside of her leg that ran from the ankle all the way up to mid-thigh. She had injured her knee when she was 17. This was before arthroscopic surgery, and she'd had to have the knee rebuilt the old-fashioned way with blades and scissors. But the scar only seemed to make her legs, both of them, look even more beautiful. The scar had a graceful curve to it as it ran some distance up her leg. Glinda wore green nylon shorts and a small white t-shirt when she ran and a headband. Her running shoes were dirty white, the color of the road dust during the dry season. I'm 32 and have six or seven more good years of running, she said whenever anyone asked her what her plans were, why she ran so much and why she'd come to our valley to train. Mostly it was the men who asked, the ones who sat with us in front of the saloon watching the river, watching the spring winds move across the water. We were all glad that winter was over. Except for Nancy, I do not think the women liked Glinda very much. It was not well known in the valley what a great runner Glinda was, and I think it gave Glinda pleasure that it wasn't. I'd like you to follow Glinda on a bicycle, Tom said the first time I met her. He had invited me over for a dinner a short time after she'd arrived. There's money available, for, available from her sponsor to pay you for it, he said, handing me some money or trying to, finally putting it in my shirt pocket. He had been drinking and seemed as happy as I had seen him in a long time after stuffing the bills into my pocket. He put one arm around Nancy, who looked embarrassed for me, and the other arm around Glenda, who did not. So I had to keep the money which was not that much anyway. You just ride along with her with a pistol. Tom had a gun holstered on his belt, a big one, and he took it off and handed it to me. You make sure nothing happens to her the way it did to that Ockerson woman. The woman named Ockerson had been walking home along the river road after visiting friends when a bear evidently charged out of the willows and dragged her across the river. She had disappeared the previous spring and at first, everyone thought she had run away. Her husband had gone around all summer making a fool of himself, bad-mouthing her. Then hunters found her body in the fall, right before the first snow. 
Every valley had its bear stories, but we thought our story was the worst because the victim had been a woman. It'll be good exercise for me, I said to Tom, and then I said to Glenda, do you run fast? Wasn't a bad job. I was able to keep up with her most of the time. Some days Glenda ran only a few miles very fast, and on other days it seemed she ran forever. There was hardly ever any traffic, not a single car or truck, and I daydreamed as I rode along behind her. Early in the morning, we'd leave the meadow in front of Tom's place and head up the mountain on the South Fork Road above the river and into the woods going past my cabin. Near the summit, the sun would be up and burning through the haze of the planting fires. Everything would look foggy and old as if we'd gone back in time and not everything had been decided yet. By the time we reached the summit, Glinda's shirt and shorts were drenched, her hair damp and sticking to the sides of her face. Her socks and even her running shoes were wet, but she always said that the people she would be racing against would be training even harder than she was. There were lakes around the summit and the air was cooler. On the north slope, the lakes still had a thin crust of ice over them, a crust that thawed each afternoon but froze again at night. What Glinda liked to do after she'd reached the summit, her face flushed and her wrists limp and loose, so great was the heat and her exhaustion was to leave the road and run down the game trail, tripping, stumbling, running downhill again. I would have to throw the bike down and hurry after her. She'd pull off her shirt and run down into the shallows off the first lake she saw, her feet breaking through the thin ice. Then she'd sit down in the cold water like an animal chased there by hounds. This feels good, she said the first time she did that. She leaned her head back on the shelf of ice behind her and spread her arms as if she were resting on a cross. She looked up through the haze at the empty sky above the tree line. Come over here, she said. Come feel this. I waded out, following her trail through the ice and sat down next to her. She took my hand and put it on her chest. What I felt was like nothing I had ever imagined. It was like lifting up the hood of a car with the engine on and seeing all the cables and belts and fan blades still running. Right away, I wanted to get her to a doctor. I wondered if she was going to die, whether I would be held responsible. I wanted to pull my hand away, but she made me keep it there and gradually the drumming slowed, became steadier. And still she made me keep my hand there until we both could feel the water's coldness. Then we got out. I had to help her up because her damaged knee was stiff. We spread out our clothes and laid them on flat rocks to dry in the wind and the sun. She'd said that she had come to the mountains to run because it would strengthen her knee, but there was something that made me believe that that was not the truth, though I cannot tell you what other reason there might have been. On every hot day, we went into the lake after her run. It felt wonderful, and lying in the sun afterward was wonderful too. Once we were dry, our hair smelled like the smoke from the planting fires. There were times when I thought that Glinda might be dying and had come to live here and live out her last days to run in a country of great beauty. By the time we started our journey home, there'd be a slow wind coming off the river. The wind cleared a path through the haze, moving it to either side and beneath it in that space between, we could see the valleys green and soft. Midway up the north slope, the ragged fires would still be burning. Wavering smoke rose from behind the trees. The temptation to get on the bike and coast all the way to was, we both did. It was the time when bears came out of hibernation and the safety of winter was not to be confused with the seriousness of summer, with the way things were changing. Walking back, we would come upon roughed grouse, the males courting and fanning in the middle of the road, spinning in a dance, the throat sacks inflated and pulsing bright orange red. The grouse did not want to let us go past. They stamped their feet and blocked our way, trying to protect some small certain area they had staked out for themselves. Glinda stiffened whenever she saw the fanning males and shrieked when they rushed in and tried to peck at her ankles. We'd stop at my cabin for lunch and I'd open all the windows. By then the sun would have heated the log walls and inside was a rich dry smell as there is when you have been away from your house for a long time. 
We would sit at the breakfast room table and look out the window at the weedy chicken house I'd never used and at the woods going up the mountain behind the chicken house. We drank coffee and ate white fish, which I had caught and smoked the previous winter. I had planted a few young apple trees in the backyard that spring, and the nursery that sold them to me said that these tra trees could withstand even the coldest winters, though I wasn't sure I believed it. They were small trees and would not bear fruit for four years, and that had sounded to me like such a long time that I really had to think about it before buying them. But I bought them anyway without really knowing why. I also didn't know what would make a person run as much as Glinda did. I liked running alongside her, though, and having coffee with her after the runs, and I knew I would be sad to see her leave the valley. I think that was what, what kept us up the distance between us, a nice distance, the fact that both of us knew she would only stay a short time until the end of August. Knowing this seemed to take away any danger, any wildness. It was a certainty. There was a wonderful sense of control. I had a couple of dogs in the backyard, Texas hounds I'd brought up north with me a few years before. I kept them pinned up in the winter so they wouldn't chase the deer, but in the spring and summer, I let them lie around in the grass dozing. There was one thing they would chase though in the summer. It lived under the chicken house and I don't know what it was. It ran too fast for me to ever get a good look at it. It was small and dark with fur, but it wasn't a bear cub. Perhaps it was some rare animal, something from Canada, maybe something no one had ever seen before. Whatever it was, it never grew from year to year, yet seemed somehow young, as if it might someday grow. It would rip out of the woods, a fleet blur headed for its burrow, and as soon as the dog saw it, they would be up and baying right on its tail. The thing always reached its burrow under the chicken house just ahead of them. Glenda and I would sit at the window and watch for it every day, but it kept no timetable, and there was no telling when it would come or even if it would. We called it a hedgehog because that was the closest thing it might have resembled. Some nights, Glinda would call me on the shortwave radio. She would key the mic a few times to make it crackle and wake me up, and then I would hear a mysterious voice floating in static through my cabin. Have you seen the hedgehog? She would ask sleepily, but it was never her real voice there in the dark with me. Did you see the hedgehog? She'd want to know. And I'd wish you were there with me at that moment. But it would be no good. Glenda was leaving in August or September at the latest. No, I'd say in the dark. No hedgehog today. Maybe it's gone away. Though I had thought that many times, I would always see it again, just when I thought I never would. How are the dogs, she'd ask. They're asleep. Good night, she'd say. Good night. One Thursday night, I had Tom and Nancy and Glenda over for dinner. Friday was Glenda's day off from running, so she allowed herself to drink and stay up late on Thursdays. Before dinner, we started out drinking at the saloon. Around dusk, we went down to my cabin, and Glenda and I fixed dinner while Tom and Nancy sat on the front porch, watching the elk appear in the meadow across the road as the light faded. Where's that famous hedgehog, Tom bellowed, puffing a cigar, blowing smoke rings into the night, big perfect O's. The elk lifted their heads, chewing the summer grass like cattle, the bull's antlers glowing with velvet. In the backyard, Glenda said as she washed the salad greens, but you can only see him in the daytime. Oh, bullshit, Tom roared, standing up with his bottle of Jack Daniels. He took off down the steps, stumbling, and the three of us put down what we were doing to get the flashlights run after him to make sure he was all right. Tom was a trapper, and it riled him to think there was an animal he did not know, could not trap, could not even see. Out by the chicken house, he got down on his hands and knees, breathing hard, and we crowded around him to shine the flashlights into the the deep, dusty hole. He made grunting noises that were designed, I suppose, to make the animal want to come out, but we never saw anything. It was cold under the stars. Far off, the, planet fi the planting fires burned, but they were held in check, controlled by backfires. I had a propane fish fryer, and we put it on the front porch, cut trout into cubes, rolled them into flour, then dropped them in hot, spattering grease. 
We fixed about a hundred trout cubes, and when we finished eating, there was none left. Glenda had a tremendous appetite and ate almost as many as Tom. She licked her fingers afterward and asked if there were any more. After dinner, we took our drinks and sat on the steep roof of my cabin above the second floor dormer. Tom sat up on the end of the dormer as if it were a saddle, and Glenda sat next to me for warmth. And we watched the fire spread across the mountainside, burning but contained. Below us in the backyard, those few rabbits that still had not turned completely brown began coming out of the woods. Dozens of them approached the greenhouse, then stopped and lined up around it, wanting to get into the tender younger, young carrots and the Simpson lettuce. I had put sheets down on the ground to trick them, and we laughed as the rabbits shifted nervously from sheet to sheet, several of them huddling together on one sheet at a time, imagining they were protected. Turn back, you bastards, Tom shouted. That woke the ducks on the pound nearby, and they began flucking among themselves. It was a reassuring sound. Nancy made Tom tie a rope around his waist and tie the other around the chimney in case he fell. But Tom said he wasn't afraid of anything and was going to live forever. Glenda weighed herself before and after each run. I had to remind myself not to get too close to her. I only wanted to be her friend. We ran and rode in silence. We never saw any bears, but she was frightened of them, even as the summer went on without us seeing any, so I always carried the pistol. We had gotten tan from lying out by the lake up at the summit. Glenda took long naps at my cabin after her runs. We both did. Glenda sleeping on my couch. I'd cover her with a blanket and lie down on the floor next to her. The sun would pour in through the window. There was no longer any other world beyond our valley. Only here, only now. But still, I could feel my heart pounding. It turned drier than ever in August and the loggers began cutting again. The days were windy and the fields and the meadows turned to crisp hay. Everyone was terrified of sparks, especially the old people, because they'd seen big fires rush through the valley, moving through like an army. The big fire in 1910 and then again in 1930, which burned up every tree except for the luckiest ones, so that for years afterward, the entire valley was barren and scorched. One afternoon in early August, Glinda and I went to the saloon. She lay down on top of a picnic table and looked up at the clouds. She would be going back to Washington in three weeks, she said, and then down to California. Almost all of the men would be off logging in the woods by then, and if she stayed, we would have the whole valley to ourselves. Tom and Nancy had been calling us the lovebirds since July, hoping for something to happen, something other than what was or wasn't. But they stopped in August. Glenda was running harder than ever, really improving, so that I was having trouble keeping up with her. There was no left ice left anywhere, no snow, no, not even in the darkest, coolest parts of the forest. But the lakes and rivers were still ice cold when we waded into them. Glenda continued to press my hand to her breast until I could feel her heart calming and then almost stopping as the waters worked on her. Don't you ever leave this place, she said as she watched the clouds. You've got it really good here. I stroked her knees with my fingers, running them along the inside scar. The wind tossed her hair around. She closed her eyes, and though it was hot, there were goosebumps on her tan legs and arms. No, I wouldn't do that, I said. I thought about her heart hammering in her chest after those long runs. At the top of the summit, I'd wonder how anything could ever be so alive. The afternoon she set fire to the field across the road from my cabin was a still day, windless, and I suppose that Glinda thought it would do no harm. And she was right, though I did not know it then. I was at my window when I saw her out in the field lighting matches, bending down and cupping her hands until a small blaze appeared at her feet. Then she came running across the field. At first, I could hardly believe my eyes. The smoke in front of the fire made it look as if I were seeing something from memory or something that had happened in another time. 
The fire seemed to be secondary, even inconsequential. What mattered was that she was running, coming across the field toward my cabin. I loved to watch her run. I did not know why she had set the fire, and I was very afraid that it might not that it might cross the road and burn up my hay barn, even my cabin. But I was not as frightened as I might have been. It was the day before Glenda was going to leave, and mostly I was delighted to see her. She ran up the steps, pounding on my door, and came inside breathless, having run a dead sprint all the way. The fire was spreading fast, even without a wind, because the grass was so dry, and red-winged blackbirds were flying out of the grass ahead of it. I could see rabbits and mice scurrying across the road, heading for my yard. It was late in the afternoon, not quite dusk. An elk bounded across the meadow. There was a lot of smoke. Glenda pulled me by the hand, taking me back inside and down the step, back out toward the fire, toward the pond on the far side of the field. It was a large pond, large enough to protect us, I hoped. We ran hard across the field, and a new wind suddenly picked up, a wind created by the flames. We got to the pond and kicked our shoes off, pulled off our shirts and jeans and splashed into the water. We waited for the flames to reach us and then worked their way around us. It was just a grass fire, but the heat was as it was intense as it rushed toward us, blasting our faces with hot wind. It was terrifying. We ducked our heads under the water to cool our drying faces and threw water on each other's shoulders. Birds flew past us and grasshoppers dived into the pond with us, where hungry, hungry trout rose and snapped at them, swallowing them like corn. It was growing dark and there were flames all around us. We could only wait and see whether the grass was going to burn itself up as it swept past. Please, love, Glenda was saying, and I did not understand at first that she was speaking to me. Please. We had moved out into the deepest part of the pond, chest deep, and kept having to duck beneath the surface because of the heat. Our lips and faces were scorched. Pieces of ash were floating down to the water like snow. It was not until nightfall that the flames died, leaving just a few orange ones flickering here and there. But the rest of the small field was black and smoldering. It turned suddenly cold and we held on to each other tightly because we were shivering. I thought about luck and about chance. I thought about fears, all the different ones, and the things that could make a person run. She left at daylight. She would not let me drive her home. She said she wanted to run instead, and she did. Her feet raised puffs of dust in the road. The Hermit Story by Rick Bass. An ice storm following seven days of snow. The vast fields and drifts of snow turning into sheets of glazed ice that shine and shimmer blue in the, mean, in the moonlight. As if the color is being fabricated, not by the bending and absor absorption of the light, but by some chemical reaction within the glossy ice. As if the source of all blueness lies somewhere up here in the north the core of it beneath one of those frozen fields, as if blue is a thing that emerges in some parts of the world from the soil itself when the sun goes down. Blue creeping up fissures and cracks from the depths of hun several hundred feet, blue working its way up through the gleaming ribs of Anne's buried dogs, blue trailing like smoke from the dog's empty eye sockets and nostrils, blue rising like smoke from chimneys until it reaches the surface and spreads laterally and becomes entombed or trapped, but still alive and smoky within those moonstruck fields of ice. Blue like a scent trapped in the ice, waiting for some soft release, some thawing so that it can continue spreading. It's Thanksgiving. Susan and I are over at Anne and Roger's house for dinner. The storm has knocked out all of the power down in town. It's a clear, cold, starry night. And if you were to climb one of the mountains on snowshoes and look 40 miles south toward where town lies, instead of seeing the usual small scatterings of light, like fallen stars, 
sunken into the bottom of a lake, but still glowing, you would see nothing but darkness. A bowl of silence and darkness and balance for once with the mountains up here, rather than opposing or complementing our darkness, our peace. As it is, we do not climb up on snowshoes to look down at the dark town, the power lines dragged down by the clutches of ice, but can tell instead just by the way there is no faint glow over the mountains to the south that the power is out. That this Thanksgiving, life for those in town is the same as it always is for us in the mountains. And it is a good feeling, a familial one, coming on the holiday as it does, though doubtless too, the townspeople are feeling less snug and cozy about it than we are. We've got our lanterns and candles burning, a fire's going on the stove, as it will all winter long and into the spring. Anne's dog, dogs are asleep in their straw nests, breathing in that same blue light that is being ex exhaled from the skeletons of their ancestors just beneath and all around them. There is the faint good smell of cold storage meat, slabs and slabs of it coming down, in, coming down into the basement. And we have just finished off an entire chocolate pie and three bottles of wine. Roger, who does not know how to read, is examining the empty bottles, trying to read some of the words on the labels. He recognizes the words the and in and USA. It may be that he will never learn to read, that he will be unable to, but we are in no rush and unlike his power lifting, he has all of his life in which to accomplish this. I for one believe he will learn it. Anne has a story for us. It's about one of the few clients she's ever had, a fellow named Gray Owl up in Canada who owned half a dozen speckled German short-haired pointers and who hired Anne to train them all at once. It was 20 years ago, she says, her last good job. She worked the dogs all summer and into the autumn and finally had them ready for field trials. She took them back up to Gray Owl, way up in Saskatchewan, driving all day and night in her old truck, which was old even then, with the dogs piled on top of each other, sleeping and snoring, dogs on her lap, dogs on the seat, dogs on the floorboard. How strange it is to think that most of us can count on one hand the number of people we know who are doing what they most want to do for a living. They invariably have about them a kind of wildness and calmness both, possessing something possessing somewhat the grace of animals that are fitted intricately and polished into this world. An academic such as myself might refer to it as a kind of biological confidence. Certainly, I think another word for it could be peace. Anne was taking the dogs up there to show Grey Owl how to work them, how to take advantage of their newly found talents. She could be a sculptor or some other kind of artist in that she speaks of her work as if the dogs are rough blocks of stone whose internal form exists already and is waiting only to be chiseled free and then released by her beautiful into the world. Basically, in six months, the dogs had been transformed from gangling bouncy puppies into six raging geniuses and she needed to show their owner how to control them or rather how to work with them which characteristics to nurture, which ones to discourage. With all dogs, Anne said, there was a tendency upon their leaving her tutelage, unlike a work of art set in stone or paint, for a kind of chitinous incrustation to set in, a sort of oxidation upon the dogs, leaving her hands and being returned to someone less knowledgeable and passionate, less committed than she. It was as if there were a tendency in the world for the dog's greatness to disappear back into the stone. So she went up there to give both the dogs and Gray Owl a checkout session. She drove with the heater on and the window down. The cold Canadian air was invigorating, cleaner farther north. She could smell the scent of the fir and spruce and the damp alder and cottonwood leaves beneath the many feet of snow. We laughed at her when she said it, but she told us that up in Canada, she could taste the fish in the streams as she drove alongside river, creeks and rivers. She listened to the only radio station she could pick up as she drove, but it was a good one. She got to Gray Owls around midnight. He had a little guest cabin, but had not heated it for her, uncertain as to the day of her arrival. So she and the six dogs slept together on a cold mattress beneath mounds of elk hides. Their last night together. 
She had brought a box of quail with which to work the dogs, and she built a small fire in the stove and set the box of quail next to it. The quail muttered and cheeped all night, and the stove popped and hissed, and Anne and the dogs slept for 12 hours straight, as if submerged in another time, or as if everyone else in the world were submerged in time, encased in stone, and as if she and the dogs were pioneers or survivors of some kind, upright and exploring the present, alive in the world, free of that strange chitin. She spent a week up there, showing Grayell how his dogs worked. She said he scarcely recognized them afield, and that it took a few days for him to get over his amazement. They worked the dogs both individually and, as Grayell came to understand and appreciate what Anne had crafted, in groups. They traveled across the snowy hills on snowshoes, the sky the color of snow, so that often it was like moving through a dream, and except for the rasp of the snowshoes beneath them and the pull of gravity, they might have believed they had ascended into some sky place where all the world was snow. They worked into the wind, north, whenever they could. Anne would carry birds in a pouch over her shoulder, much as a woman might carry a purse, and from time to time would fling a startled bird out into that dreary, icy snowscape. And the quail would fly off with great haste, a dark, feathered buzz bomb disappearing quickly into the teeth of cold. And then Grey Owl and Anne and the dogs, or dog, would go and find it, following it by scent only, as always. Snot icicles would be hanging from the dog's nostrils. They would always find the bird. The dog or dogs would point it, at which point Grey, or Anne, Grey Owl or Anne would step forward and flush it. The beleaguered bird would leap into the sky again, and then once more they would push on after it pursuing that bird toward the horizon as if driving it with a whip. Whenever the bird wheeled and flew downwind, they would quarter away from it, then get a mile or so downwind from it and push back north. When the quail finally became too exhausted to fly, Anne would pick it up from beneath the dog's noses as they held point staunchly, put the tired bird in her game bag, and then replace it with a fresh one. And off they'd go again. They carried their lunch in Grey Owl's day pack, in case, uh, as well as emergency supplies, a tent and some dry clothes in case they should become lost. And around noon each day, well, they could rarely see the sun, only an eternal ice white haze, so they relied instead only on their rhythms within. They would stop and make a pot of tea on the sputtering little gas stove. Sometimes one or two of the quail would die from exposure and they would cook that on the stove and eat it out there on the tundra, tossing the feathers up into the wind as if to launch one more flight, and then feeding the head, guts, and feet to the dogs. Perhaps seen from above, their tracks would have seemed aimless and wandering rather than with the purpose, the focus that was burning hot in their and the dogs' hearts. Perhaps someone viewing the traps, tracks could have discerned the pattern or perhaps not, but it did not matter for their tracks, their patterns, the directions, the tracing of them, were obscured by the drifting snow, sometimes within minutes after they were laid down. Toward the end of the week, Anne said, they were finally running all six dogs at once, like a herd of silent, wild horses through all that snow. And as she would be going home the next day, there was no need to conserve any of the birds she had brought, and she was turning them loose several at a time, birds flying in all directions, and the dogs, as ever, tracking them to the ends of the earth. It was almost a whiteout that last day, and it was hard to keep track of all the dogs. Anne was sweating from the exertion as well as the tension of trying to keep her eye on and evaluate each dog. The sweat was freezing on her in places, so that it was as if she were developing an ice skin. She jokingly told Grey Owl that the next time she was going to try to find a client who lived in Arizona or even South America, Grey Owl smiled and then told her that they were lost. But no matter the storm would clear in a day or two. They knew it was getting near dusk. There was a faint dulling to the sheer whiteness, a kind of increasing heaviness in the air, a new density to the faint light around them. And the dogs slipped in and out of sight, working just at the edge of edges of their vision. The temperature was dropping as the north wind increased. No question about which way south is. We'll turn around and walk south for three hours. And if we don't find a road, We'll make camp, 
Gray Owl said. And now the dogs were coming back with frozen quail held gingerly in their mouths. For once the birds were dead, they were allowed to retrieve them, though the dogs must have been puzzled that there had been no shots. Anne said she fired a few rounds of the cap pistol into the air to make the dogs think she had hit those birds. Surely they believed she was a goddess. They turned and headed south, Anne with a bag of frozen birds over her shoulder and the dogs, knowing that the hunt was over now, all around them. A, once again, like a team of horses in harness through wild and prancy. After an hour of increasing discomfort, Anne's and Grey Owl's hands and feet numb and ice beginning to form on the dog's paws so that the dogs were having to high step, they came in day's last light to the edge of a wide clearing, a terrain that was remarkable and soothing for its lack of hills. It was a frozen lake, which meant, said Grey Owl, they had drifted west, or perhaps east, by as much as 10 miles. Anne said that Grey Owl looked old, tired and old and guilty, as would any host who had caused his guests some unasked for inconvenience. They knelt down and began massaging the dog's paws and then lit the little stove and held each dog's foot one at a time over the tiny blue flame to help it thaw out. Grey Owl walked out to the edge of the lake ice and kicked at it with his foot, hoping to find fresh water beneath for the dogs. If they ate too much snow, especially after working so hard, they'd get violent diarrhea and might then become too weak to continue home the next day or the next or whenever the storm quit. Anne said she could barely see Grey Owl's outline through the swirling snow, even though he was less than 20 yards away. He kicked once at a sheet of ice, the vast plate of it with his heel, and then disappeared below the ice. Anne wanted to believe that she had blinked and lost sight of him, or, or that a, a gust of snow had swept past and hidden him, but it had been too fast, too total. She knew that the lake had swallowed him. She was sorry for Grey Owl, she said, and worried for his dogs, afraid they would try to follow his scent down into the icy lake and be lost as well. But what she was most upset about, she said, to be perfectly honest, <laughs> was that Grey Owl had been wearing the little day pack with the tent and emergency rations. She had it in her mind to try and save Grey Owl and to try to keep the dogs from going through the ice. But if he drowned, she was going to have to figure out how to try and get that day pack off of the drowned man and set up the wet tent in the blizzard on the snowy prairie and then crawl inside and survive. She would have to go into the water naked so that when she came back out, if she came back out, she would have dry clothes to put on. The dogs came galloping up, seeming as large as deer or elk in that dim landscape against which there was nothing else to give them perspective. And Anne woed them right at the lake's edge where they stopped immediately as if they had suddenly been, been cast with a sheet of ice. Anne knew they would stay there forever or until she released them. And it troubled her to think that if she drowned, they too would die. They would stand there motionless as she had commanded them for as long as they could until at some point, days later perhaps, they would lie down, trembling and, exa trembling and exhausted. They might lick at some snow for moisture, but then the snows would cover them and still they would remain there, chins resting on their front paws, staring straight ahead and unseeing into the storm, wondering where the scent of her had gone. Anne eased out onto the ice. She followed the tracks until she came to the jagged hole in the ice through which Grey Owl had plunged. She was almost half again lighter than he, but she could feel the ice cracking beneath her feet. It sounded different too, in a way she could not place. It did not have the squeaky percussive resonance of the lake ice back home. And she wondered if Canadian ice froze differently or just sounded different. She got down on all fours and crept closer to the hole. It was right at dusk. She peered down into the hole and dimly saw Grey Owl standing down there, waving his arms at her. He did not appear to be swimming. Slowly, she took one glove off and eased her bare hand down into the hole. She could find no water, and tentatively, she reached deeper. 
Gray Owl's hand found her and he pulled her down in. Ice broke as she fell, but she but he caught her in his arms. She could smell the wood smoke in his in his jacket from the alder he burned in his cabin. There was no water at all, and it was warm beneath the ice. This happens a lot more than people realize, he said. It's not really a phenomenon. It's just what happens. A cold snack, snap comes in October, freezes a skin of ice over the lake. It's got to be a shallow one, almost a marsh. Then a snowfall comes, insulating the ice. The lake drains in fall and winter, percolates down through the soil. He stamped the spongy ground beneath them. But the ice up top remains, and nobody ever knows any differently. People look out at the surface and think, aha, frozen lake, Gray Owl laughed. Did you know it would be like this? Anne asked. No, he said. I was looking for water. I just got lucky. Anne walked back to the shore beneath the ice to fetch her stove and to release the dogs from their woe command. The dry lake was only about eight feet deep, but it grew shallow quickly closer to the shore so that Anne had to crouch to keep from bumping her head on the overhead ice and then crawl. And then there was only space to wriggle. To emerge, she had to break the ice above her by bumping and then battering it with her head and elbows like the struggles of some embryonic hatchling. And when she stood up, waist deep amid, amid the sparkling shards of ice, it was nighttime now, the dogs barked ferociously at her, but remained where she had ordered them to stay. And she was surprised at how far off course she was when she climbed out. She had traveled only 20 feet, but already the dogs were twice that far away from her. She knew that humans had poorly evolved almost non-existent senses of direction, but this error over such a short distance shocked her. It was as if there were a thing in us there were in us a thing, an impulse, a catalyst that denies our ever going straight to want to another thing. Like dogs working left and right in the wind, she thought, before converging on the scent. She gathered the stove and the dogs. She was tempted to try and go back the way she had come out. It seemed so easy, but considered the consequences of getting lost in the other direction and instead followed her original tracks out to where Grey Owl had first dropped through the ice. It was true night now, and the blizzard was still blowing hard, plastering snow and ice around her face like a mask. The dogs did not want to go down into the hole, so she lowered them to Grey Owl and then climbed gratefully back down into the warmth itself. The air was a thing of its own, recognizable as air and breathable as such, but with a taste and odor and essence unlike any other air they'd ever breathed. It had a different density to it, so that smaller, shallower breaths were required. There was very much the feeling that if they breathed too much of the strange, dense air, they would drown. They wanted to explore the lake and were thirsty, but it felt like such a victory simply to be warm, or rather not cold, and they were so exhausted that instead they made pallets out of the dead marsh grass that rustled around their ankles, and they slept curled up on the tiniest of hammocks to keep from getting damp in the pockets and puddles of dampness that still lingered here and there. All eight of them slept as if in a nest, heads and arms draped across others' ribs and hips, and it was, said Anne, the best and deepest sleep she'd ever had the sleep of hounds, the sleep of childhood. And how long they slept, she never knew. For she wasn't sure later how much of their subsequent time they spent wandering beneath the lake and then up on the prairie, homeward again. But when they awoke, it was still night, or night once more. And clearing, with bright stars visible through the porthole, their, port, their point of embarkation. And even from beneath the ice, in certain places where for whatever reasons, temperature, oxygen content, wind scour, the ice was clear rather than glazed. They could see the spangling of stars, though more dimly. And strangely, rather than seeming to distance them from the stars, this phenomenon seemed to pull them closer, as if they were up in the stars, traveling the Milky Way, or as if the stars were embedded in the ice. It was very cold outside, up above, and there was a steady stream, like a, a current, like a river, of the night's colder, heavier air plunging down through their porthole, as if trying to fill the empty lake with that frozen air. 
But there was also the hot muck of the earth's massive respirations, breathing out warmth and being trapped and protected beneath the ice so that there were warm currents doing battle with the lone cold one. The result was that it was breezy down there and the dog's noses twitched in their sleep as images brought by these scents painted them painted themselves across their sleeping brains in the language we call dreams, but, for, but which for the dogs and perhaps for us was reality. The scent of an owl, real, not a dream. The scent of a bear, cattail, willow, loon, real, even though they were sleeping and even though those things were not visible, only over the next horizon. The ice was contracting groaning and cracking and squeaking up tighter, shrinking beneath the great cold, a concussive grinding sound as if giants were walking across the ice above. And it was this sound that had awakened them. They snuggled in warmer among the rattly, dried, yellowing grasses and listened to the tremendous clashings as if they were safe beneath the sea and were watching waves of starlight sweeping across their hiding place or as if they were in some place, some position where they could watch mountains being born. After a while, the moon came up and washed out the stars. The light was blue and silver and seemed, Anne said, to be like a living thing. It filled the sheet of ice just above their head with a shimmering cobalt light, which again rippled as if the ice were moving rather than the earth itself with the moon tracking it. And like deer drawn by gravity, getting up in the night to feed for an hour or so before settling back in, Gray Owl and Anne and the dogs rose from their nests of straw and began to travel. <clears throat> you didn't, you know, engage, Susan asks a little mischievously and a little proprietary, perhaps. Anne shakes her head. It was too cold, she says. I sneak a glance at Roger, but cannot read his expression. Is he in love with her? Does she own his heart? But you would have if it hadn't been so cold, right? Susan asks and Anne shrugs. He was an old man in his 50s. The dogs were around. But yeah, there was something about it that made me think of those things, she says, careful and precise. I would have done it anyway, Susan says, even if it was cold and even if he was a hundred. <laughs> we walked a long way, Anne says, eager to change the subject. The air was damp down there. And what it, whenever we'd get chilled, we'd stop and make a little fire out of a bundle of dry cattails. There were little pockets and puddles of swamp gas pooled here and there, she said. And sometimes a spark from the cattails would ignite one of those. And all around these little Pockets of gas would light up like when you toss gas on a fire. These little explosions of brilliance like flash bulbs, marsh pockets igniting like falling dominoes or like children playing hopscotch until a large enough flash pocket was reached, sometimes 30 or 40 yards away from them by this point, that the puff of a flame would blow a chimney through the ice, venting the other pockets and the fires would crackle out. The scent of grass smoke sweet in their lungs and they could feel gusts of warmth from the little flickering fires and currents of the colder, heavier air sliding down through the new vent holes and pooling around their ankles. The moonlight would strafe down through those rents in the ice and the shards of moon ice would be glittering and spinning like diamond motes in those newly vented columns of moonlight. And they pushed on, still lost, but so alive. The mini explosions were fun, but they frightened the dogs. And so Anne and Gray Owl lit twisted bundles of cattails and used them for torches to light their way rather than building warming fires. Though occasionally they would still pass through a pocket of methane and a stray ember would fall from their torches and the whole chain of fire and light would begin again, culminating once more with a vent hole being blown open and shards of glittering ice tumbling down into their lair. What would it have looked like seeing from above the orange blurrings of their wandering trail beneath the ice? And what would the sheet of lake ice itself have looked like that night, throbbing with the ice-bound subterranean blue and orange light of moon and fire? But again, there was no one to view the spectacle. 
only the travelers themselves, and they had no perspective, no vantage or loft from which to view or judge themselves. They were simply pushing on from one fire to the next, carrying their tiny torches. The beauty in front of them was enough. They knew they were getting near a shore, the southern shore, they hoped. <laughs> As they followed, the glazed moons lure above. When the dogs began to encounter shore birds that had somehow found their way beneath the ice through small fissures and rifts and were taking refuge in the cattails, small winter birds, juncos, nuthatches, chickadees skittered away from the smoky approach of their torches. Only a few late migrating or winter trapped snipe held tight and steadfast and the dogs began to race ahead of Gray Owl and Anne, working these familiar scents. Blue and silver ghost shadows of dog muscle weaving ahead through the slants of moonlight. The dogs emitted the odor of adrenaline when they worked, Anne said, a scent like damp, fresh cut green hay, and with nowhere to vent, the odor was dense and thick around them so that Anne wondered if it too might be flammable, like the methane, if in the dog's passions, they might literally immolate themselves. They followed the dogs closely with their torches. The ceiling was low, about eight feet, as if in a regular room, so that the tips of their torches' flames seared the ice above them, leaving a drip behind them and transforming the milky, almost opaque, cobalt and orange ice behind them, wherever they passed, into wandering ribbons of clear ice, translucent to the sky. A script of flame, or buried flame, ice-bound flame, and they hurried to keep up with the dogs. Now the dogs had the snipe surrounded, as Anne told it, and one by one, the dogs went on point, each one freezing as it pointed to the birds' hiding places. And it was the strangest scene yet, Anne said, seemingly, surely underwater, and Gray Owl moved in to flush the birds, which launched themselves with vigor against the roof of the ice above fluttering like bats, but the snipe were too small, not powerful enough to break through those frozen four inches of water. Though they could fly 4,000 miles to South America each year and then back to Canada six months later, is freedom a lateral component or a vertical one? And as Gray Owl kicked the, kicked the clumps of frostbent cattails where the snipe were hiding, and they burst into flight only to hit their heads on the ice above them, they came tumbling back down, raining limp and unconscious back to their soft, soft grassy nests. The dogs began retrieving them, carrying them gingerly, delicately, not preferring the taste of snipe, which only ate earthworms. And Anne and Gray Owl gathered the tiny birds from the dogs, placed them in their pockets, and continued to the shore chasing that moon, the ceiling lowering to six feet, then four, then to a crawl space. And after they had bashed their way out with elbows, fists, and forearms, they stepped back out into the frigid air. They tucked the still unconscious snipe into little crooks and branches up against the trunks of trees and off the ground, out of harm's way, and passed on south, as if late in their own migration. While the snipe rested, warm and terrified and heart-fluttering, but saved for now against the trunks of those trees. Long after Anne and Grayel and the pack of dogs had passed through, the birds would awaken, their bright eyes luminous in the moonlight, and the first sight they would see would be the frozen marsh before them, with its chain of still steaming vent holes stretching back across all the way to the other shore. Perhaps these were birds that had been unable to migrate owing to injuries or some genetic absence. Perhaps they had tried to migrate in the past but had found either their winter habitat destroyed or the path down there so fragmented and fraught with danger that it made more sense to these few birds to ignore the tuggings of the stars and seasons and instead try to carve out new lives, new ways of being, even in such a stark and severe landscape. Or rather, in a stark and severe period, knowing that lushness and bounty were still retained within that landscape, that it was only a phase, that better days would come, that in fact, the snipe knowing these things with their blood 10 million years in the world, the austere times were the very thing, the very imbalance that would summon the resurrection of that frozen richness within the soil. If indeed that richness, that magic, that hope, 
did still exist beneath the ice and snow. Spring would come like its own green fire if only the injured ones could hold on. And what would the snipe think or remember upon reawakening and finding themselves still in that desolate position, desolate place and time, but still alive and with hope? Would it seem to them that a thing like grace had passed through as they slept? That a slender, winding river of it had passed through and rewarded them for their faith and endurance? Believing, stubbornly, that the green land beneath them would blossom once more. Maybe not soon, but again. If the snipe survived, they would be among the first to see it. Perhaps they believed that the pack of dogs and gray owls and Anne's advancing torches had only been one of winter's dreams. Even with the proof, the scribings of Grace's passage before them, the vent hole still steaming, perhaps they believed it was only one of winter's dreams. It would be curious to tally how many times any or all of us reject or fail to observe moments of grace. Another way in which I think Susan and I differ from most of the anarchists and militia members up here is that we believe there is still green fire in the hearts of our citizens. Beneath this long snowy winter, beneath the chitin of the insipid, that there is still something beneath the surface. That our souls are still of more worth, more value than the glassine lattice ice, latticed ice structures visible only now at the surface of things. We still believe there's something down there beneath us as a country. Not that we're better than other countries by any means, but that we are luckier. That ribbons of grace are still passing through and around us, even now, and for whatever reasons, certainly unbeknownst to us, and certainly undeserved, unearned. Gray Owl and Anne and the dogs headed south for half a day until they reached the snow-scoured road on which they had parked. The road looked different, Anne said, buried beneath snowdrifts, and they didn't know whether to turn east or west. The dogs chose west, and so Anne and Gray Owl followed them. Two hours later, they were back at their truck. Two hours later, they were back at their truck, and that night, they were back at Gray Owl's cabin. By the next night, Anne was home again. It's about being beneath the ice, about living beneath the ice, and that it seems to her as if she was down there for much longer than a day and a night, that instead she might have been gone for years. It was 20 years ago when it happened. Gray Owl has since died, and all those dogs are dead now too. She is the only one who still carries, in the flesh at any rate, the memory of that passage. Anne would never discuss such a thing, but I suspect that it, that one day and night, helped her give her a model for what things were like for her dogs when they were hunting and when they went on point, how the world must have appeared to them when they were in that trance, that blue zone where the odors of things wrote their images across the dog's hot brain pans, a zone where sight and the appearance of things, surfaces, disappeared and where instead their essence, the heat molecules of scent, was revealed, illuminated, circumscribed, possessed. I suspect that she holds that knowledge, the memory of that one day and night, especially since she is now the sole possessor, as tightly and securely as one might clench some bright small gem in one's fist. Not a gem given to one by some favored or beloved individual, but even more valuable. Some gem found while out on a walk, perhaps by happenstance, or perhaps by some unavoidable rhythm of fate, and hence containing great magic, great strength. Such is the nature of the kinds of people living scattered here and there in this valley. Well, there we are, Mo. <laughs> Great. It's an interesting time doing stories this way. <laughs> I can't thank you enough. And I can't tell you, I think that that the story that you read 
had been rewritten by Rick Bass by the time you got the copy of it, you did, because it's different than the copy of it I have. Oh, really? Well, I, I uh, read it directly from the published book. Um, this, this Yes, book. and I have it from an anthology that oh, was, yeah. was maybe a different one. Oh, and so okay. it was lovely hearing the differences. Well, I'd be curious to look at that one. Well, I'd <laughs> have to send it to you. Yeah, please do. It, it, it ends quite a bit differently. But oh, it's, it's, they're both just lovely. Yours oh. is edited down a little bit. So it was kind of sweet to see that. Yeah, but it's very concise, I think. It is. And his writing tends to be very thoughtful and at times really spare. Yeah, but sometimes he rhapsodizes a little bit, but still, I, I think his writing is very thoughtful and your reading was very thoughtful as well. And Jean, if you're there somewhere in the ether, yours was as well. I'm glad I always have a copy of these right in front of me because <laughs> it's a little safety. Yeah, for sure. I'm glad you did too. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Mo. And thank you, Jean. And I got to tell you that next month, we're going to look forward to the words of an author by the name of, oh gosh, what is her name? I'm going to tell you here in just a minute. Molly Giles. She has a little bit of a problem with men, but bless her heart, she writes beautifully. And I get to read, as does Meredith Daniel. And I think you will enjoy it. It will be on September 15th. Same bat time, same bat channel. <laughs> and Mo, thank you so much. And you, uh, Sean, thank you as always for making it work in spite of all of our little peccadillos that we have. <laughs> thank you, Mo. Thank, thank you. Sean. Thank you, Jean, thank you wherever you are. <laughs> yeah, thanks. It was nice to meet you, Jean. <laughs> She's a peach. <laughs> <laughs>